What's up, everybody? Welcome into another YouTube live show. I am John Kurtz. Thank you for accommodating my schedule this week, going on a Thursday instead of a Wednesday. I got uh, sweet tickets to the Royals game last night, so I pushed the live show to today. For those of you that uh, don't get to catch this live as per usual, I totally understand. We uh, we have a workaround for that later, but part of the reason I got to hop on today is because, uh, man, my guy Scott Drew is coming back, and I don't just say that because I am a, uh, a K-State fan. Uh, I think Grant McCaslin was going to be the call anyway, and John Jake is probably, if not Grant McCaslin is the next head coach at Baylor had Scott Drew left, but uh, I have been a Scott Drew early adopter, my friends. I have thought the guy was incredible when he was still getting a lot of crap for like, oh, just, you know, he's the guy that just rolls the ball out there, greasy, gets all the talent, and then just rolls the ball out there. That's it. I have loved Scott Drew for a very long time, and I, I did a radio show in Manhattan where I was constantly – pounding the table for him and telling people that they were dumb for hating on Scott Drew. One of the best coaches there has ever been. One of the best coaching jobs there has ever been. And he's staying in Waco and having that happen at the expense of Kentucky fans, wildly hilarious, literally the worst college sports fan base that I have ever run across. They make Kansas seem like a bunch of, uh, I, I don't know, like a bunch of people in a nursing home, you know, just very calm, nothing subdued, Nothing going on there. Kentucky fans are insane. Insane. K-State playing them twice in the tournament, beating them twice in the tournament in the last six years. Part of how I have uh, come across that and uh, and found out everything I needed to know about Kentucky fans there, and they've shown their true colors this week with how they've handled things in light of Scott Drew opting to stay in Waco. So I want to talk a lot about that because I do think there's a broader point there too about what, it means that the Big 12 has kept another coach. And I know basketball is a different scenario than football where everybody expects the football coaches to be poached. But it just seems like all the way around, like the Big 12 generally keeps most of its coaching talent um, to the chagrin of everybody else and against the predictions of everybody else. That's what's really been happening, I guess, with the exception of Jed Fish. But can we even really count that because he wasn't technically in the Big 12 yet when he left? So... That's been a, a growing trend here as the league is able to hang on to its big coaching targets elsewhere. And uh, I am I am just extremely, extremely glad that that played out that way for everybody involved. Baylor fans, Tech fans, uh, I suppose K-State fans and just fans of the league and fans of the sport, damn it. I mean, it's just a good thing for the sport, regardless of what oafs like Jeff Goodman are going to, uh, to try and tell you. Yes, I do have some... Uh, conference realignment for you i did a video earlier this week about the latest in the florida state case but um i honestly think the latest updates are pretty funny from what happened on uh, tuesday there was some great coverage from matt baker um i know that greg flugar like live streamed the whole thing so you can you can actually go out there and watch it if you want it was a it's a lot of content to consume it was like six seven hours when it was supposed to be like an hour and a half so if that tells you anything about where where this is and how convoluted all this is i i don't know what uh, what else would um but we can continue to react to that as i did in the video uh you know we've got a couple other little stories there was one maybe i lost that one i'll have to pull it up again about the north carolina board basically that those from chapel hill being told to kind of like the rock like shut up and know your role is that do i have that right shut up and know your role I, i'm not a wrestling guy i'm trying to remember what that was off the top of my head but anyway and uh an article from mac engel in the fort worth star telegram about uh the big 12 basically being a party to hurting high school football which is something that the nfl is uh is doing as well by the fact that they're just coming for like literally every single day of the week prime real estate there but i'm always happy to uh share in whatever it is that you guys want to talk about you know how to do it if you've been here before you click the dollar sign below the chat box it attaches a super chat to your chat attaches a donation rather to your chat makes it a super chat and uh that will get you on the show tonight as a way to control the content. It is a way to make your voice be heard. And of course, a way to support the work that I'm doing on this channel to bring you conference realignment, college football, college basketball content on a regular basis. Uh, could not do it without the very generous support of all of you guys who do do that. So I, I really, truly do appreciate it a ton. 
And uh, even those who are unable to, there is a way to support the channel. Just one like, just one like on the video. That's it. That's all I ask for, just a click. Um, but those are great, really helps me out. And what helps out also is generating discussion in the comment section underneath the video. Just take a second, drop in a quick little comment there. Even if you're telling me I suck, you hate me, whatever it is. Um, if you're telling me know your role and shut your mouth, which Ryan has so generously supplied for me here that The Rock said, know your role and shut your mouth, um, you can leave that as a comment toward me uh, right now. That would be great. Get the discussion going. Helps with the YouTube algorithm. Obviously, tell your friends as well. Uh, and if you are not watching it live, like I said earlier, I know it's a different night tonight, so people's schedules may be a little bit different. Completely get it. John Dash Kurtz Dash Four on Venmo. If you want to be a part of the conversation, you can leave a donation there. And if you do leave your question or comment with that, I will read it to kick off the next show. So you can still be a part of the discussion as well, even if you're not here to join us totally live. Okay, that's what I got. Appreciate all of you being here. And uh, look, I, I know we, we talk a lot of realignment and the Florida State thing is very pertinent. I promise you I will get to that. But I, I really, I really selfishly, I want to talk about Scott Drew and what happened here today. I mean, it has been the biggest story basically in college athletics for the last 24 hours and continues on because it's Kentucky. And, you know, Kentucky fans thought they had a legitimate chance at Dan Hurley, which is laughable and and the kentucky job it is still great it may be the best in college basketball it is certainly debatable whether or not it would be but in the the realignment or excuse me not the realignment area the nil era it's not quite it, it's lost a little bit of some of the advantages that it had before when recruiting was about more than just directly being able to make it a payment you know, I mean, yes, I think we all are suspicious about payments happening there at Kentucky over the years, even before it was legal, but it technically wasn't legal. And now it's much more transactional. And so the advantages of the Kentucky job are neutralized at least a little bit, at least a little bit because of how much money matters. And as long as you can get another school that has boosters that decide that they, hey, we want to take out some extra cash and be really competitive here, like Kentucky doesn't have as big of an advantage as they used to. But this whole saga was just so, I mean, it just encapsulated almost everything about college sports that we love, that we hate, and that just make it what it is. I mean, first of all, the fact that you had, we, we went way beyond, way beyond the flight tracker stuff that typically accompanies a coaching search. Like that was small potatoes for Kentucky pursuing Baylor's national champion, future Hall of Famer head coach. Because we got all the way to Scott Drew tweets a photo of himself at a local Mexican restaurant because he's trying to throw everybody off the scent that his family's actually on that plane. And there was so much flight tracking going on that he was like, well, this is a little bit dangerous. Let me uh, let's let's provide some cover there and show everybody that I'm in Waco. And it got to the point where people are breaking down the family feud episode that was on the TV behind him and looking up. <laughs> people were looking up. It said that. According to the local TV guide, it should have been an episode from 2020, but people took the survey that was up there and they said, hey, actually, that's an episode from 2022. I'm out of that backwards, the two years there. But you get the point. That was the level of detail that was going into this. You also had Kentucky fans reportedly calling the restaurant and somebody tricking someone at the restaurant to handing the phone to Scott Drew and actually chatting with him. I mean, just wild. Now, some of that stuff... I mean, it's a little much. It's a little creepy. Uh, be careful, Kentucky fans. But there is a part of me that's like, that is sort of what makes college sports great, is having stuff like that happening. Now, what's not great is that I did see somebody mention, I didn't go verify this myself, but I saw somebody mention today that Kentucky fans were then providing like one-star reviews for the restaurant today when Scott Drew opted to stay at Baylor, which that is a chicken you know what move uh from kentucky fans there and that's everything that's wrong with college sports but the other thing that's completely wrong with college sports is like the attitudes of now i haven't listened to specifically what jeff goodman said about scott drew but he is to me a, about as elitist as it gets out of anybody out there in the college sports landscape he is constantly wanting great coaches to be leaving the places where they've built something and go to these 
elite jobs or jobs that he thinks are better. And it's it's infuriating. You know, I mean, tech fans, I know you guys have had a long standing grudge with Goodman. You guys absolutely should, despite the fact that tech was like a possession away from winning a national championship. Just uh, what? That was 2019. Was it 19? Yeah, it was 19. So like five years ago, tech is within like a possession of winning a national championship. You know, the guy celebrates Chris Beard going to Texas and was constantly crapping on Texas Tech fans throughout that whole process and still goes out of his way to take some shots there. And then, you know, it's personal for me recently because he was actively on his podcast saying I was rooting for Jerome Tang to, I mean, just actively rooting for Jerome Tang to take the Arkansas job because he thinks it's a place where he can win a national championship and that it can't be done at K-State. I wonder what he would have said about Baylor 10 years ago. Uh, I'm sure he would have said the same thing. I'm sure he would have said the same thing about Texas Tech before they played for a national championship and came that close. And it just, I hate that, man. That's just like, we don't need people doing that. We need, the thing that makes college sports great is that if you have coaches that stay and build these programs up and you have different programs in different locales that are not the typical blue bloods, that are not the titans of the sport, and you allow them to really grow and blossom and you have these unique things, not like homogenized success at Kentucky. Great. Scott Drew could go have success at Kentucky. We've seen a million coaches have success at Kentucky. Who cares? That's not unique. That's not fun. That's not good for the sport. What's good for the sport is Baylor winning a freaking national championship and having a guy who's going to spend his entire career there that took it from a completely scandal filled wasteland to a national championship and the greatest arguably the greatest turnaround story in college athletics, man. I mean, it's, it's insane what Scott drew did there and to think, Oh no, the real answer here would be, he just, he needs to go to con- screw anybody that thinks that man. So I'm just, it's such a good thing for the sport. Let, let's, let's paint it against the backdrop of just what's happening with college athletics. Anyway, it's skewing so much toward brands that yes, basketball is, is, a little bit shielded from it because football is where this is really happening, but there will be trickle down effects to basketball because of the money gap that's going to exist between all these schools moving forward and schools in the big 10 and the sec are going to make so much more money. And it's because we're just conglomerating the biggest brands. We're skewing everything so hard toward the biggest brands that those are the ones that are only, those are the only ones that are going to be able to like truly survive in the new college athletics world. So we don't need that with our basketball coaches, like jumping to that. We don't need that. Let them stay and spread it out. And and even if you are a fan of a blue blood, deep down, you know that it's better for the sport for this to be the case. Deep down, you know that like that's, you don't want to be tearing apart the fabric of college sports. I dropped that video earlier today with Andrew Marchand. I have a part two coming out and I can't remember which, part it was i feel like it might be part two that you guys haven't seen yet but marshant said he was like look i don't think it's good business for the big 10 or the sec to break away and do their own thing because you don't want to be the ones that are held responsible for destroying the fabric of college sports and that's basically what's happening right now and scott drew going to kentucky would be another little jab at the fabric of college sports man it would have been so lame so lame so it's a win for everybody man it's a win for everybody that this happened. And I am so glad that Scott Drew made that decision. And it, you know, I was following closely Trilly's Discord last night, which, you know, re- earn, it certainly earned the $6 for this month in terms of entertainment value, where you had Scott Drew's godson that apparently was verified by Trilly, Scott Drew's godson in there, like giving information. But all the inside info seemed to indicate that, like, this really was very largely family driven by drew that like scott drew may have wanted to go homer drew according to the godson homer drew his father wanted him to go but yet the family really didn't want to go and so he wasn't going to mess with that he wasn't going to mess with happy uh to up and leave waco for that which i mean thank god for the family uh shout out to kelly shout out to everybody involved there in that in that decision that helped keep scott drew there so scott himself may have actually wanted to go to scratch and it's in his career. And I understand the allure of the Kentucky job. I understand being a competitive guy. I can even understand, Hey, maybe I want a new challenge after I've been here in Waco and I've done it to the highest of highs where I won a national championship. I, I can get that, but it is, it is so much better in the long term for 
everybody involved, I suppose, except Kentucky, for Drew to just remain in Waco. Whatever the reasons are that kept him there, this is it, man. This is the thing. And I feel so good for Baylor fans. I know Texas Tech fans are freaking out because, again, if you're following Trilly, Grant McCaslin, he said, was already being contacted yesterday by Baylor in the event that Scott Drew was going to take this job. So there, there certainly was a lot of legitimate concern that Scott Drew was going to take the job and McCaslin probably would have been next in line. That, that also would be very lame. I don't want Texas Tech to lose their coach after one year. I wouldn't want it to happen with Jerome Tang and K-State after two years if that's what was going to happen. Um, it just would have been bad all the way around for the Big 12. Like somebody would have gotten the short end of the stick there, whether it's Texas Tech, K-State, in all likelihood, somebody in the Big 12 is taking the short end of the stick and having to hire a coach at the very end of a hiring cycle. And when you're not Kentucky, when you're not a job like that, it's a really, really difficult thing to do. Now, I know I'm going to react to this. I do see I do see somebody mentioning Mark Pope. This still could be a big blow to the Big 12 if Mark Pope were to leave. He's a former Kentucky Wildcat himself and uh, an outstanding coach at BYU. I, I truly I think he's a very good coach. I think he's kind of underrated, flies under the radar a little bit right now. Um, and especially like BYU didn't make noise in the NCAA tournament, so that didn't didn't help in keeping him a little bit more under the radar. Look, I think he could win at Kentucky for sure. I have a hard time seeing Kentucky making that higher. And I understand at a certain point, if people are saying, no, you can't make the splash that you really want to. I don't know. It's just, it's the most anti-splash hire that Kentucky could possibly make. If you thought Scott Drew was kind of an anti-splash hire, which Kentucky fans did, which is insane. Uh, just asinine. Mark Pope is, is that times 10. Um, if they're going to make that higher. So I, I still doubt that that is going to happen. If it did, yes, it would be a loss for the big 12 and that would be lame. And everything that I'm saying here still applies to that. I would not want to see it happen, but I guess at least in that case, it's not somebody that's been there for 20 years and built that into such a unique, such a uniquely powerful thing. And the other part is Mark Pope's an alum, you know, Scott Drew's not an alum of Kentucky. Pope is an alum. He went there. He played there. He won a national championship there. So He's a Kentucky guy that wouldn't sting nearly as much as Drew leaving. He's also, if we want to take this another big picture angle, he's one of the guys on like the Mount Rushmore of Big 12 basketball coaches right now, which is what you're trying to hang your league on. You're hanging your league on elite basketball. And Brett Yormark is trying to turn this league into something that can generate extra money via basketball, via how good that is. It's not going to be good to lose Scott Drew. Uh, Grant McCaslin would be a fine replacement. Maybe over time he would develop into a guy like Scott Drew. Maybe. But we know Scott Drew is Scott Drew. And so losing that from your league, it's it's not good for anybody. And again, the musical chairs probably wind up leaving somebody else in your conference without a good coach that's going to go have to hire at a really rough time here in uh, in the coaching cycle. So it would have been detrimental to your league. You want to keep Kelvin Sampson. You want to keep Bill Self. You want to keep Scott Drew. Like those are the guys that you, they need to be the faces of this league and continue to lead the league into this new, new venture, which is going to be accentuating basketball to the max. Coming off of a year where you didn't have a very good NCAA tournament, some of the narrative is kind of turned on you thanks to the ACC and then not having a good tournament, not getting anybody to the Elite Eight. It would have been a blow for the conference to then lose one of the Titan coaches that you have to Kentucky, just to have them plucked away by one of the best jobs, you know, symbolically, this is a nice win and tangibly it's a nice win to try and keep your basketball prowess going as much as possible to, to squeeze as much juice out of that damn orange as you can uh, with hoops for the league. So um, those are a lot of my thoughts. There's a lot of my thoughts on, the Scott Drew situation and why I'm, I'm just thrilled that that happened. And I was watching it very intently. Yes. I, I do have the underlying K state reason to be at least have been a little bit leery about it and wanted to watch it for that reason. But it was so much more than that. It was because to me, this was kind of like a battle of good versus evil. Like you can't just, just don't let Kentucky win this thing just to be able, they don't even Kentucky fans aren't even grateful for it. They don't even really want him, but they kind of just go get him because they can. And the Big 12 just loses one of its icons because of that. No, 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 no. Put your foot down. And, and the Big 12 did uh, with Scott Drew making that decision. 
And it's just hilarious. I will say, I'm going to get to you in just a moment, Eddie. Um, it is hilarious. I watched this unfold with Arkansas too. And just conversations that I was having with Arkansas media when Jerome Tang was more or less offered the job. I know Arkansas media now and their athletic director at their rah, rah Calipari press conference said, well, he was the only guy that ever actually got offered the job. Come on, dude. We know if Chris Beard would have said, Hey, I'm in, you would have hired Chris Beard. We know if Jerome Tang would have said, Hey, I'm in, he was going to be the guy. We're not dumb. But there's this weird pride thing with that. We're not going to officially, officially offer until someone says they would take it. And everybody wants to play that game. And it's 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 just really stupid. But we've seen it now I, twice with Arkansas and then with Kentucky out of the SEC where they're both trying to play that game a little bit. There was some of that from Kentucky too. Like, oh, you know, Scott Drew, like who, who said it today? I think it was like a TV reporter. According to my sources, Scott Drew was never actually offered the job. I these sec places they just can't stand to have their egos hurt a little bit and it 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 hurts the ego it hurts their ego that they they get turned down by big 12 coaches i mean even the hubris in the sec does start to extend a little bit to basketball now too and it's just to get the hell out of here with that man so to have had that happen it would have been brutal. Instead, we get to laugh at Kentucky fans who, as the night went on, I mean, I was watching them in the Baylor chat in, in Trilly's discord. I was watching them on Twitter and, and their media folks, like just so much confidence. Like, yeah, he hasn't decided fully yet, but 90%, this is going to happen. Of course, this is going to happen. I heard the same thing from Arkansas people when Jerome Tang was in the throes of that, where it's, you know, uh, nice, nice enough guy that I'm DMing with Arkansas media member, but saying the same thing, like, yeah, Hey man, I think it's, I think it's his, like, I think, think he's going to be taking it and i was saying look everything i'm hearing on my side is that k-state is going absolutely all in to try and keep him here and there's actually quite a bit of optimism that he's not going to be leaving and the sec side just like doesn't really hear it or want to believe it because they've got these enormous egos and so i I watched that happen up close now with back-to-back coaching hires here and it's quite satisfying man it's quite satisfying to be able to take it in and be like yeah middle finger buddy the big 12 is not going to just roll over and die while you pluck all the coaches and look at what happened in, in football this year. You know I mean? Football coaches were pursued in the big 12. Yeah. Jed fish did leave, but Lance Leipold was also at one point, it, it, it was almost exactly like the Jerome Tang experience for K state fans. Leipold at one point, everybody was saying, Hey, this is actually the guy the search is really focusing on right now at Washington. He didn't go. He stayed back at Kansas two off seasons. Now after an unbelievable coaching job, everyone's ranking him now in the top 10 of coaches in the country. And he has stayed put Chris Kleiman contacted by Nebraska contacted by Washington. uh, At least that I know of that he is shut down, not budging on that, not going to leave. Like the coaches in this league, generally Mike Gundy has been so good for so long. And despite some flirtations with other jobs, never left. He decided to stay. Um, You know, we've just seen it over and over again with a lot of these really good coaches in the league. Everyone wants to come poach them. Every time we joked about how every college football opening this last cycle, it was like, hey, here's Chris Kleiman, Lance Leipold, Matt Campbell. Here's like five Big 12 coaches and then a couple others on every single opening because that's how highly thought of the coaching is here. And you're not you're not getting your coaches plucked like crazy right now. There's a lot of really special things happening in this league because coaches have been willing to stick around and try and build here in the Big 12. Anyway, Eddie, appreciate you, my guy. Eddie says, hi, buddy. Glad to get your live update. Go Big 12. Yes, this is a this is a positive Big 12 day. Cheers to the Big 12. And uh, cheers to you, Eddie. Eddie Lozano, San Antonio Real Estate. If you need... A real estate agent in San Antonio, you know who to call. Uh, Eddie Lozano, San Antonio Real Estate. Appreciate you, Eddie. Thank you, thank you, my friend. If you guys want to be like Eddie and join the show tonight, click the dollar sign below the chat box. It will attach a donation to your chat, make it a super chat, pins it in a separate column from me, ensures that you make it on the show tonight to voice your opinion, control the content, and support the work that I'm doing to bring you this college football, college basketball, and conference realignment content on the channel. Couldn't do it without all of your support, so I really, really do appreciate those of you uh, who do genuinely, genuinely appreciate it. Uh, You can like the video, too. Totally free way to support the channel. Just give me one click. That's it. That's all I need. Uh, Just one click on the video, 
and uh, leave a comment in the comment section. Let me know what you think. Even if you're an angry Kentucky fan and you want to come in and tell me that that job is great and Scott Drew is an idiot, whatever it is, leave it in the comment section and uh, let's get those comments going. John Dash Kurtz Dash Four on Venmo as well. If you're not catching it live and you want to support the channel that way, plus if you leave a question or comment there, I will read it on the next show. So you can uh, you can still be a part of the show that way. I love seeing a lot of hate on uh, Kentucky fans here. They are they are crazy, man. It's it's another breed of just awful, like unbelievable arrogance. Like the thing, like Kansas fans. I mean, those of you who follow me on Twitter, I mean, you know that I have my my run-ins there. It's like Kansas fans have a lot of arrogance. Kansas kind of earned that arrogance much more so than Kentucky here in recent years. Uh, yeah, although you know, hey. I will say this in defense of Kentucky fans. Yeah. Kansas has not made the second weekend each of the last two years. So there is that. Um, but in general, I mean, they have a national championship right before that. And Kentucky just has failed over and over again to get, get out of the first weekend. And, you know, I've seen them lose twice to K state in the tournament in the last six years. Like that, that program is not what people think it is down there right now. Uh, the hubris is insane. And they also just have this like, they're just a little more crazy. You know, Kansas fans are just obnoxiously arrogant. Sometimes Kentucky fans are like, they have all the obnoxious arrogance, but turn it up a couple of notches and then just make it dumber. I mean, that's kind of, if I'm just being honest, I was dancing around it a little bit. That's kind of what it is. It's just like a dumber brand of arrogance. <laughs> that's what, that's what Kentucky brings to the table. So I got to experience that firsthand particularly last year when Marquise Noel and company uh, knocked them out in the NCAA tournament. And then they freaked out about Jerome Tang saying that K-State just had more dudes, which was a fact in that game. They, they freaked out about that comment. How dare somebody not kiss the rings? I, I don't know, man. Those rings are getting pretty dusty. The rings are getting pretty dusty, Kentucky, for people to be kissing. So I would just – I would chill out on that a little bit. Um. I, I love that. I love that Kentucky fans are, are getting dunked on here. Now they, they may well wind up. This could very well be another Arkansas situation where I, to me, it would be kind of akin to if they, if they get Billy Donovan, which if I were them, I would 1000% be waiting on to, to see if he's going to end his season next week in the NBA. And you could be able to go just pick him up in a week. That's totally what I would be doing if I were Mitch Barnhart in Kentucky, because I think he's, miles better than anything else out there right now that they could uh, realistically attain. That would be a pretty good outcome for them. Maybe a better outcome than getting Scott Drew, because I think Billy Donovan would be more fit just in terms of personality to handle that kind of a job. So that, that very well may be true that this works out better for Kentucky anyway, but for right now they're squirming and it's fun to watch them squirm. And it's fun to watch John Rothstein tweet Hey, watch out for Mark Pope. He's definitely going to be a candidate at the Kentucky job. And you get to watch the quote tweets of Kentucky fans melting down about it all. Um, let's take advantage of it now, man. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. You got the SEC on their heels. It's not every day that one of the non-Power 2 conferences gets a dub in over the SEC. That's happened now here with Scott Drew. So I, uh, I'm happy to see it. I hope everybody else is... Uh, is happy to see it and yeah now i mean maybe kentucky will have to go back to its its ex you know sloppy seconds with rick patino that's that's another option potentially for kentucky out there i mean like you know and sean miller i'm sure sean miller is a fine enough basketball coach but i'm seeing sean miller thrown out there as a as a uh potential replacement i mean i'm like dude kentucky I'm, sean if, if k-state were hiring coach today and they're like hey sean miller you're like, uh, yeah, okay. Like I could probably get behind that. I mean, that's how I feel about it for K-State. So I can only imagine how Kentucky fans feel about that. Some of the names being thrown around there. Uh, Papa Bravo. What's up, Papa Bravo? Oh, jumped on me there. Sorry about that. Papa Bravo, what's going on? I think this is a very good point. Thank you for your support of the channel, Papa Bravo. Uh, Papa Bravo says the Kentucky men's basketball job is a lot like Nebraska football. Not as desirable as the fans think it is. Calipari disappeared like a fart in the wind. It's a good comp. Now, Kentucky is Nebraska football on steroids because, well, Kentucky may not have won at the highest level and been to Final Fours and national championships here lately, like they certainly would like to act like they have. 
I mean, Nebraska has been like a four and eight program for the last 10 years. So four and eight, five and seven kind of program versus, Hey, I mean, at least they're typically winning a lot of games in like a three through six seed in the NCAA tournament. So Kentucky's, I will give them credit for that. They've got that going for them. Uh, but yeah, Nebraska, I mean, the arrogance out of Nebraska also very, very hilarious that the only thing they're clinging to right now is big 10 money. It certainly ain't anything on the field. Although shout out to Fred Hoiberg for getting them to the NCAA tournament this year, had a little better basketball season. I'll give you that. I'll give you that Husker fans, but that's a, that's a pretty good comp Papa Bravo. It's a pretty good comp. I'm trying to think of, you know, I mean, there's a little bit of Texas football there probably, uh, but Texas fans just aren't as, there's not quite as much passion in the Texas football fans as there is in the, in the Kentucky, you know, just a crazy Kentucky basketball passion. Who else in the football? I feel like I should be hitting a better example in the football world, the college football space of what would match up with what Kentucky is, you know, a program, but because you need the real boy. Well, a lot of people would probably point to like, I saw a lot of people ranking worst college sports fan bases yesterday in honor of Kentucky. So congrats, Kentucky. You drove everybody there. But I saw a lot of Tennessee football being thrown out there as what people consider to be like the worst. I don't know. I don't know enough about like the SEC culture and landscape. I don't I just don't deal with Tennessee fans. It's not even the culture. I I don't deal with Tennessee fans on a regular enough basis to have any idea. So somebody Somebody would have to fill me in on that. Auburn football. Auburn football is not bad. Auburn football is not bad. But I, the thing with Auburn is I think they are somewhat neutered just because they they had to share a state with Alabama for so long. So that that puts some that puts some governors on how just crazy, crazy nuts you can get with being over the top with your arrogance like that. That will humble. Even if you're not trying to be humbled, Nick Saban will humble you, man. Nick, Nick Saban will humble you for sure. Um, so I think that's the, that's the problem with that, but these are good thoughts. These are good thoughts. Um, click the dollar sign below the chat box to, uh, attach a donation to your chat, make it a super chat. If you do want to be on the show here, let me check and see if I had any other Scott true angles, honestly, like that's, that's the story that is the most fun to me right now that I would, I would just love to, uh, to continue talking about here, but I know I do need to get to the, uh, the Florida state update here at some point. Um, well, let me hit Eddie here. This is a nice little transition. This is a nice little transition as we bring in Josh Pate. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Appreciate your contributions to the channel tonight, my friend. Again, if you need a, uh, if you need a real estate agent in San Antonio, make sure you hit up my guy, Eddie Lozano. Eddie says, Josh Pate stated that he felt the big 12 is America's conference. I tend to agree. I think this fall, the big 12 will definitely be the most competitive and entertaining conference. I saw the bit that Josh Pate did on the Big 12 being America's conference. And I look, I I agree. I mean, the Big 12, I'm not going to sit here and say that, like, it's legitimately everything that's great about college athletics. But it certainly embodies a lot of what is really great about college athletics. Like, there are huge fan bases. Like, these are big schools, huge fan bases and fan bases that are incredibly passionate and care a lot and have tons of unique traditions, schools that are very different in terms of culture. So you have, I would just say like very unique, like kind of idiosyncrasies with all the different schools, which is a part of what makes college sports great to me. Um, and you have places that are very, very committed and doing everything they can to like maximize everything they possibly can out of what they have right now, which I also think is a great trait. If you're talking about like America, if you're going to call it America's conference, like big 12 schools are out here grinding, man, they're grinding, they're grinding to utilize their resources the best that they possibly can do everything they possibly can to keep the coaches around. Like I was talking about earlier, that takes a lot of people really, flexing what they got as much as they can squeezing as much as they can as much juice as they can out of that orange that's what this league does and uh, it prides itself on that and it certainly deserves to pride itself on that because it's done a tremendous job with it so i would absolutely agree with that eddie and i think that fits the theme of what we are talking about here and that's why it was so damn important that scott drew didn't just up and go join kentucky you know i heard 
I was listening to Gary Parrish earlier today, who is maybe my favorite voice on college basketball. And it was the Eye on College Basketball podcast on CBS Sports, which I really should have listened to more this year than I did. But I've been listening to it a lot since the tournament. And he made this comment about the Kentucky job. He's like, look, man, it, it, you got to be really bad to not succeed at Kentucky. It, it is built to win. And if you don't win, you're the problem. And I was like, yeah, I don't really disagree with that too much. But I was like, that's just so lame. Like, what? Where's the fun in that? You know, I mean, Big 12 schools, generally, you're not getting that sort of thing. Kansas basketball, I suppose, is there. But outside of that, not really much of that. Like, you, it means, in a way, it means more to the fans because of that. Because none of it is guaranteed. You got to fight and scrap, especially in this landscape now. You got to fight and scrap for every little thing that you get. Nobody's giving you an inch. You got to earn it all if you're a Big 12 school right now. And that is very much... It's the American dream, right? Everybody working hard, working crazy work hour. That's capitalism, dude. Like that's, that's what it is, man. You got to work your butt off for everything. Now, the other problem is along with capitalism comes the big 10 and the sec figure out how to kind of monopolize and game the system. Uh, and that's the other part of it. But anyway, uh, Eddie, appreciate it. Good thoughts there. Um, appreciate everybody here. My God, it hurt. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking at heard Will Howard is running with the threes at Ohio State. Boy, I would feel bad for Will if that is the case. Look, K-State needs a backup quarterback. We've been talking about it if you listen to the Three Ma podcast. K-State needs a backup quarterback. They need to go portaling for a backup quarterback here in the spring. Um, I'm I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Uh okay, appreciate all of you guys there. Click the dollar sign below the chat box to uh, attach a donation to your chat make it a super chat if you want to be on the show like the video if you can would really appreciate that leave a comment in the comment section um let's read some of this update from florida state to uh, give you a little bit of conference realignment here the little bit of conference realignment uh from matt baker who you heard on the channel or saw on the channel recently that was within that uh, was like last friday i did that interview with uh with matt baker who was tremendous that guy, I mean, he talked about all he's having to read with these court cases. He's legitimately there, like in the courtroom for the six and a half hour marathon. Uh, he says seven in the uh, lead of the story here. So seven hour marathon in court on Tuesday. He says near the end of arguments in Tuesday's seven hour legal hearing between Florida State and the ACC, a hypothetical scenario started to feel real. What if dueling lawsuits between the Seminoles and their conference keep unfolding simultaneously in Florida and North Carolina? Quote, then we do have chaos, ACC attorney James Cooney said. Matt Baker says, buckle up. Um, that's what happened. Uh, Leon County judge this is in Tallahassee. The judge, who was a Florida State grad, uh, John C. Cooper, denied the ACC's motion to postpone Florida State's lawsuit against the league in Tallahassee. Uh, Cooper's ruling from the bench comes less than a week after a Charlotte judge issued his opinion that the ACC's lawsuit against Florida State will continue in North Carolina. So you got two lawsuits in two states, and uh, it seems like the the argument from the ACC was like, dude, this will be chaos. Like, this will be totally chaotic. If we have two different lawsuits going on at the same time in two different states, how are we supposed to, like, this, this will be insane. And the the basic argument the florida state made that wound up working was that their lawyers were like look this is a huge deal we originally said it was going to be 572 million dollars potentially at stake here for florida state to leave the conference now they've somehow decided to up that number to 700 million so they're saying this is a 700 million dollar deal like 700 mil is on the line here for a an entity in the state of florida that should be we, like that case needs to be heard in the state of florida and the judge is like all right yeah fair point so you're going to have that stay in Florida. And uh, meanwhile, in North Carolina, they were not going to let the ACC shop that case around and move that one around. So it's going to stay in North Carolina and keep going. So here we go. Uh, how that actually gets sorted out, I don't know. But it does seem like the, these sorts of things and saying that it's going to be chaos, assuming that it really will be chaos, probably leads you even quicker down the road toward a settlement at some point here. That would be my guess. It feels like everything continues to move toward that. But again, I caution you with any of this stuff when we're talking about things in court. I am not a legal expert. That is not my area of expertise. I will try to give you my opinion best I can. 
but just keep that in mind. That is fair warning to everybody. Uh, Matt Baker says that means the nine figure future of the Seminoles, the league and nationwide conference realignment will continue playing out in two different courtrooms in two different States under two sets of applicable laws at the same time. And that, that part gets crazy too, because now you, you have everybody in these cases talking about the fact that the documents that ESPN and the ACC don't want out there that ESPN says have trade secrets. They don't want that to be public. A lot of that stuff might be public in one of the cases in one of the States and not in the other because we have different state laws. Again, chaos and very befitting of college athletics. No, it's not a system that makes perfect sense with like a, a playoff and, you know, you win your division, you're in, you get a wild card, you're in, and then we just play it all out. And it, no, man, college football forever. It's been Florida State goes undefeated. They don't get in because we leave it up to somebody. It's just very subjective. We leave it up to somebody to decide. We've had split national champions before. One poll, you're a national champion. One poll, you're not. One state, you can reveal these documents. One state, you can't. It's so perfect for college athletics and college football that this is where this is all going. Um, is uh, da, 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 The dueling lawsuits. The dueling lawsuits between Clemson and the conference in both Carolinas add complexity to when, how, and if two of the ACC's biggest heavyweights could leave. The ACC had hoped for a different outcome when it sued Florida State on December 21st, a day before Florida State's trustees met to sue the conference first. Uh, Cooper, who is the judge, took issue with some of the ACC's filing. He had questions about whether the conference followed its voting protocols before or after its filed complaint in Charlotte. The ACC's presidents and chancellors approved an amended lawsuit against Florida State during a special January 12th virtual meeting. There's been some controversy over this, who was there, who was not, who was invited, who was not. Uh, ACC officials said the vote was unanimous among present members, but they did not say who was present. There's, there's been some digging done here. Uh, Florida State was not invited according to emails obtained. That's, that's good reporting there by the Tampa Bay Times and Matt Baker who figured that out. Uh, Clemson said it never authorized the suit, so the Tigers weren't there. Leaves one other. I guess my speculation would be North North Carolina, since they seem to be the other school that's in the market right now to be suing the ACC potentially if North Carolina can get permission from its board. They can get permission from mom and dad to go do this, which is what that situation kind of feels like right now, overbearing parents for the Tar Heels that they're going to have to deal with. Um but regardless of the participants, Cooper, the judge, said it seemed like part of a rush to the courthouse or forum shopping, two things that are legally frowned upon. So forum shopping, trying to get the case heard in the state that would be most friendly to you. That's that's kind of what the judge is uh, insinuating here. Could have been at play for the ACC. I mean, it certainly feels like a rush, right? I mean, that was the whole point. Like, it was a rush to get in there and get the suit filed because they wanted to be the one that would be attended to first. Didn't want the ACC to have the upper hand or rather Florida state to have the upper hand on that when they started to, uh, to figure out what was going on. Uh, other factors were at play too. Cooper suggested the state of Florida's broad open records law could mean some documents like the TV contract between ESPN and the ACC should be public in Florida, but maybe not in North Carolina. Uh, the contract is a sticking point in this dispute and has made some key figures tricky to pin down. I mean, like, yeah, of course, Florida is the state where we might get to see this, right? Florida feels like the wackier, wilder, zanier state. So, yeah, they're going to be the one that may allow you to go take a peek in at these, uh, I guess, ESPN would argue, proprietary documents that they think nobody should be able to actually look at. But then that that would not be the case in North Carolina. You wouldn't be able to apply I guess whatever's in there to what's going on in the case in North Carolina. I do find this part very interesting. Florida state upping their dollar figure total from 572 million to 700 million in terms of what it would take to leave the conference. So FSU initially said it's total cost to leave the ACC would be 572 million. Uh, they get that with an exit fee of about 130 million plus withheld TV revenue through 2036. Uh, that's the end, obviously, of the contract. FSU attorney Peter Rush. I mean, well, let me start with this. That total figure, Rush, Peter Rush, FSU's attorney said, isn't 572 million. It's more like 700 million. Now we're at a point where 
for intents and purposes of what this is, what they're trying to argue here, I don't know that it makes much of a difference between 572 and 700. If they're trying to argue, hey, in the state, when you have an entity in the state that's this important and this much money is on the line, should be heard in the state of Florida. Does it really matter if it's 572 or 700? Probably not. But I guess it, you know, for optics sake, if you can find ways to continue to drive it up there, you, you might as well, I suppose. Um, I just would love to know where the extra money is coming from. <laughs> I'd love to know where Florida State's getting that. Um, and on top of that, it is great that there's a note included here from Matt Baker. I saw this being tweeted, like the people that were following this as it was happening. FSU attorney Peter Rush said that's 12 years of TV rights for what should have been the national champions home games. Oh, that's right. Our lawyers are quite partisan. And no, I don't mean politically. They are quite partisan to the teams that they are representing, the schools that they are representing. By God, if we're not going to get a reference in within the court case to the fact that the college football playoff screwed Florida state, I mean, you're mistaken. If you think we're not going to get that, of course we're going to get that because not only is it ridiculous and very college football, but also you're trying to continue to drive the point home that like, Hey, the ACC, uh, their initial arguments were it was just like malpractice by the ACC, what they've done for the league. They've screwed everybody by mismanaging it. And now that leads to us being in a position where nobody respects us enough to even put us in the playoff at unbeaten 12 and 0. I mean, kind of brilliant because it works on two levels. Like you roll your eyes like, oh, okay, of course, like this is, this is very much indicative of the sport. But then at the same time, you're like, well, it continues to help like subconsciously dig at that narrative that the ACC is just incompetent and kind of worthless. And you, you better let Florida state out here because they should have been the national champs, but they weren't, but they weren't. Um, Rush said, this is Florida state's money. This is Florida state's team. This is Florida state's media rights. Um, Cooper agreed enough. This is the judge again. He agreed enough to decide that the state of Florida has a major stake in this litigation's outcome. That means it's continuing here, even as it persists in North Carolina. Uh, though Florida State said in a filing Tuesday that it will appeal last week's opinion to the North Carolina Supreme Court. So that's going to be going on. That's one of your next steps there, I suppose, seeing what the Supreme Court in North Carolina is going to say about all that. Uh, from Baker, uh, Tuesday's hearing in room 3G of the Leon County Courthouse initially was scheduled for 90 minutes, but after three hours, the judge hadn't even finished his first talks with the ACC. Um, I said this on the recorded video, but I mean, the most perfect thing here for the sport and where we're at is like somebody, how did we not get Fox or ESPN involved here to televise this thing with commercials? How did that happen? Like Greg Flugar is on top of it. He got it streamed. But where is Fox or ESPN? Stream it. Throw some commercials in there if it's going to be this long. It's the doldrums of the offseason right now for college football. College hoops is even over. Like People are just trying to watch baseball in the NBA, I guess. But for college sports fans, sell some commercials, dude. Get in there. Um, by the end of the day, many issues remained unsolved or unresolved. Cooper did not hear arguments for and against the conference's motion to dismiss Florida State's case or matters related to discovery. So not only is it upheld, like, hey, we need to keep this in Florida. Florida State gets that win. But the judge didn't hear arguments for and against the conference's motion to dismiss Florida State's case. Didn't get to that. Um I guess matters related to discovery. That's something Florida state may, may be more keen on actually happening, but it feels to me like all told that was a pretty good day in court for Florida state. Pretty good day in court after yes, in North Carolina, they did not get the result that they were looking for there, which, you know, I think was a long shot to get the case dismissed in North Carolina, certainly a long shot. Um, but Florida state makes up for it with a, a pretty, pretty good day earlier this week so there's your update with a little bit more reaction on what is going on with uh with fsu um yeah let me see if i the story that and shout out to uh to jamie who sent me the story about north carolina um uh, let me go do unc trustees need to quote stay in our lane uh memo shows 
their power is scaled back. And when we say UNC, this is about those from Chapel Hill as opposed to like just the overall Carolina system board of governors. It's been talked about a lot. Now, NC State has a lot of influence there. And that's that's a part of why now North Carolina has to like get permission from mom and dad to do anything related to realignment. They've got to bring that permission slip back home. You know, remember when remember when you used to have to it was like a typically like a bad grade card, I guess, right? They, you'd have to go get it signed by mom and dad. You know, you can't just pretend that they saw it. You've got to get it actually signed. You've got to get that permission slip actually signed. Uh, UNC is going to need that if they want to go on the field trip to the SEC or the Big Ten. Uh, but here's the lead from this story. It's the Char- I, this, the news and observers that Charlotte uh, top leaders in the UNC system wrote to members of UNC Chapel Hill Board of Trustees, appearing to remind them of their responsibilities and scale back their powers, according to a memo obtained by the news and observer. As one trustee views it, the memo essentially told board members at the university they need to, quote, stay in our lane, uh, though the board's chair disagrees with that interpretation telling the news and observer he viewed it as purely administrative. Now there's a lot in this and a lot of it is it's stuff that's well beyond just college athletics. So again, I'm not going to try and pretend to you that like, I fully understand the context of everything that is going on here. Um, But I do say that to point out like that seems to be kind of the general gist of everything that's happening in North Carolina right now is that, UNC may be a little bit handicapped, a little bit neutered here and trying to make whatever moves they're going to want to make in conference realignment. Uh, before I get out of here, and this is like your two, three, four, five minute warning or so. So if you got a buzzer beater, you want to get in now is the time click the dollar sign below the chat box to create a super chat. If you want to get in here before the show is done, it is buzzer beater time, but I need to uh, get to a couple of other super chats. Appreciate you, Eddie. Eddie back here again. Eddie Lozano, San Antonio Real Estate. Back to the conversation about the Big 12. He says, I am also happy with the way the new fan bases are starting to mesh. I appreciate their input. The conversations are very interesting. Oh, it's definitely become interesting. Uh, And I even appreciate the camaraderie between, like last night, I saw some camaraderie between K-State Tech and Baylor fans with everything happening with Scott Drew, which makes sense. I was even laughing at like a tech fan that I saw that was kind of like, you know, someone was like, Hey, and after this, we should all remember how great this feels and be friends. And he was kind of like, no, no, it's only in like these times of chaos and trouble that we band together. Right. I'm going to go back to hating you guys, but that's, that's a microcosm of what happened with conference realignment, right? All of a sudden everybody was facing an existential crisis and everybody kind of pulled together. Now you're getting new faces engineered into that uh ucf fans we've gotten to know their fairly brash personality although it was humbled a little bit with what the football season was this past year certainly uh byu just the nicest damn people around like hard to ignore that um and cincinnati and houston fans i have not seen or heard quite as much out of them but they also seem very cool and houston had a phenomenal basketball season so uh, yes, I'm, I'm with you, Eddie. I love, I love the way all of it is trending and now we get even more. Now you're welcoming in the four corner schools, which adds even more spice to it. Uh, particularly with Utah and, uh, the somewhat rocky relationship that everybody got off to there. But I, uh, I love it, Eddie. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support of the channel. Same to you, hiking cat. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. Hiking cat says lots of posts last 30 minutes hope to kentucky well i was seeing a lot of that in the chat um let's see what let's see what dy said so the dy uh first thing i i see when i pull up twitter holy bleep okay wow this mark pope thing is real huh i see josh the first thing that popped up was uh josh pate said get in we're headed to the kentucky message boards and it is a it is a ch- big truck that comes wheeling around the corner at a high rate of speed. And literally the entire thing is on fire. So, so there's that. Yeah. 39 minutes ago, this is all happened during the show. 39 minutes ago, Jeff Goodman said, Kentucky has focused its search on BYU head coach and former Wildcats player, Mark Pope. And now Jeff Goodman says breaking Kentucky is expected to hire BYU's Mark Pope barring a last second collapse in negotiations. Sources told the field of 68, that's crazy, man. 
That's crazy. Oh, dude. I mean, look. I am happy for... Whew, I am happy for Mark Pope because he's an alum, a Kentucky alum that is now getting the Kentucky job. And that is huge for him. But I do not envy what he's going to walk into in terms of what the reaction will be from Kentucky fans about this hire. That's like, it's the same kind of what they would view as like a little bit more milk toast, not splashy, but it doesn't come with a national championship like Scott Drew did. Uh, boy, Jeff Goodman says Kentucky AD Mitch Barnhart swung for Scott Drew, Dan Hurley and Nate Oates. He missed uh, 15 years ago. He was persuaded to go after someone with baggage. This time he went with his choice. Mark Pope. Uh, Jeff Goodman says, here's what I will say about Mark Pope. He has way more SHIT to him than most realize. And people are saying, what does that even mean? I'm kind of wondering what that really means too. Like, is that that like he's he's got more substance? I, Jeff Goodman. <laughs> you guys know my thoughts on Goodman. I'll just let that one sit. Um, Mark Pope, man. Mark Pope. I'm just reading all the reaction, guys. I'm so, uh, so Gary Parrish says Kentucky is about to hire Mark Pope after aggressively pursuing or after never aggressively pursuing Billy Donovan at any point, according to Matt Norlander. That's another thing. It's just going to drive Kentucky fans insane. And I, I think it probably should. Like, again, nothing against Mark Pope. And BYU fans, I feel for you. Uh, I think Mark Pope is a really, really good, solid coach. And he's been at Kentucky as a player, so he obviously is going to understand the landscape of that better than some. So I I wish him nothing but the best. I wish he would have stayed at BYU. That is a bummer for the league. Um, but damn, to not aggressively pursue Billy Donovan and then go with Mark Pope, I, I would... It feels like you could have had Mark Pope in a week had you waited around to see what Billy Donovan would actually do. Now... We're taking Matt Norlander at his word that they didn't actually aggressively try to pursue him there. Boy, maybe they did and they got like a pretty hard no back through the back channels, but I, I don't know, man. I'd be upset if I were a Kentucky fan. I mean, this is, that's got to be like DEFCON 5, whatever the worst DEFCON is uh, for Kentucky fans right now. So Hiking Cat, thank you for that. That was an important, everybody, everybody thank Hiking Cat here for uh chipping in a donation there to tell me that and redirect the chat there because that that was incredibly important incredibly important thank you i can cat david what's up david uh david appreciate your support of the channel as always my friend david says can't wait to hear clemson's hearings uh thinking acc being double whammy yeah i mean that's the that's the thing like we're still like in the first stages of this clemson has their whole other thing to go and like They'll get a chance to see Florida State's tactics, how well they're working here, and then try and plot their way forward after that. I don't even know really where to begin on the Clemson stuff. It's enough to, to just focus on the two that, that Florida State has going on, and then you have two with Clemson and the ACC. You have four total cases. They're in three different states because one of those then is in South Carolina. So, like, now you're talking about three states' jurisdictions, three different types of of laws that could be in all three states, three different ways that those could all be like um, looked at from a legal standpoint. It's, it's a lot, man. It's a lot. So yeah, I will pull out the popcorn for that too, David. I absolutely will. And they may not be the last, maybe mom and dad will let North Carolina do it too, you know, or maybe they'll just sneak out in the middle of the night. Maybe they'll just slip through a window in the middle of the night and actually uh, get out there. Daniel, what's up, Daniel? Glad to have you here. Uh, Daniel, Cat Fan in Husker Land, a.k.a. Daniel Osborne. Daniel says, came in late. How about the Royals sweeping the Astros? Keep up the good work. Yes, Daniel. I was there at the K last night. I didn't, like, finish that story, did I, earlier. I got suite tickets, and I was actually in the suite last night at Kauffman Stadium watching the Royals beat up on the Astros. I was in the suite that was supposed to be for the Astros owner. I don't. Who is the Houston Astros owner? Houston Astros owner. Jim Crane. It was supposed to be uh it was supposed to be Jim Crane's suite. He decided not to come. And one of my buddies is dating a girl who works 
with the chiefs that was like giving tickets to this suite. And he was like, Hey man, you should come like, this is sweet. Like all sorts of food and stuff. It was crazy, man. Any kind of food or drink you could ever imagine at the ballpark. Like it was, it was awesome. Uh, and then watch the Royals just totally dump truck the, uh, the Astros from there. So yes, shout out to the Royals. And then they dump truck the Astros again today. Uh, again, this afternoon, so the Royals are rolling, man, nine and four, I believe right now. So shout out to the Royals. Shout out to my guy, Daniel. Thank you for being here and, uh, appreciate your support of the channel as always. Wow. Mark Pope, Mark Pope. How are we feeling about Mark Pope? Everybody. Um, I don't know, man. If the if the Kentucky AD is okay with the fans, probably won't be mad about the hire. I I don't know, I don't know. And I know, I know Rick Pitino's endorsing him. I know that that's um that's something that was said by Trilly like months ago that Rick Pitino would really push for Mark Pope to be the hire there if it opened. It this honestly, I do agree with you guys and some of the sentiment I'm seeing there from that Kentucky fans are gonna hate it. This honestly may be the absolute best thing for them. I could definitely see that. We're like, Kentucky wants the splash. They want the Billy Donovan kind of thing. They want the, you know, obviously Tan Hurley would be a total grand slam. But they want to shoot for the moon on all those things. They want Jay Wright, right? They want like Jay Wright. They want things like that. But really what may be the best thing for them is to take the Mark Pope, just a really good, solid coach who may not be that splashy. John Calipari was, he had plenty of flash and plenty of media attention that followed him around. It, it wasn't getting, getting it done by the end of this thing. So you guys may well be right. You guys may well be right. Um, okay. Uh, that's, that's going to do it for me. This is crazy. Hey, let me know what you think in the comments, the comment section of the video uh, down below about the Mark Pope hire at Kentucky. We got, we got to break, we got to break a, uh, a story here in uh in the chat i'm gonna have to i'm looking up uh i'm I'm not entirely sure what you're getting at here uh lb i i literally just googled it to see like an urban dictionary am i missing something here everything that pops up is seinfeld uh with the double dipping mm, boy well there certainly are things that are pulling up on uh on urban dictionary, but it looks, uh, looks a little, looks a little too, uh, non PG here for the end of the chat, but hell of a buzzer beater, hell of a buzzer beater LB. <laughs> Appreciate you, man. Uh, all right, guys, tell your friends about the channel, uh, word of mouth, social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, threads, X, wherever it is that you're at on social media, let your friends know if you got fans of your school, fans of the league, tell them about the channel and like the video on your way out the door. I would really appreciate that. John Dash Kurtz Dash Four on Venmo. If you didn't catch this live and you want to weigh in, uh, leave me a donation there. BYU fans, how are you feeling right now? Like, leave me a donation there with your question or comment. I will read it to begin the next live show coming up on Sunday. So appreciate all of you guys. Thanks for being here, and I will talk to you soon.